Our theme tonight is on the calling of God, and you have one scripture mentioned in your bulletin, but in the literature I was sent, there were three scriptures, not just Romans eleven twenty nine, but also Ephesians 1, uh, 18, and Philippians 3, 14. So I want to make a few brief comments on those. The passage in Romans 11 talks about Israel and reminds us that God's gift and His call are irrevocable. And you know that's true in Deuteronomy 7, 7, God chose Israel and said, I didn't choose you because you were the most numerous of all. In fact, you were the fewest of all the people. And I want to call your attention to Ezekiel chapter 16 that focuses in greater detail on the great paradox of a holy and righteous God calling a very sinful people uh, to follow him. Ezekiel chapter 16, uh, compares, uses somewhat of a racial slur with reference to Israel and said, ah, your ancestry and your birth were in the land of Canaan. Your father was an Amorite and your mother was a Hittite. <laughs> that was not politically correct to say. And then the sovereign of the universe said, you know what you were like? He said, Verse 4, on the day you were born, your cord was not cut, nor were you washed with water to make you clean, nor were you rubbed with salt or wrapped in cloths. No one looked upon you with pity or had compassion. You know, it was like a little unwanted baby was thrown out on the garbage heap. That was Israel. And the Lord found Israel in that shape. He said, you know, I, I washed you. Uh, verse 8, I passed by, and when I looked at you and saw you, that you were old enough for love, I spread the corner of my garment over you and covered your nakedness. I gave you my solemn oath and entered to a covenant with you, declares the sovereign Lord, and you became mine. I bathed you with water and washed the blood from you and put ointment and so forth. He did everything he could for his bride. And then, of all things, the bride became a prostitute. And she gave herself to anybody. The Egyptians, the Assyrians, the Babylon, it didn't matter. And she was so undesirable. Verse 32, you adulterous wife, you prefer strangers to your own husband. Every prostitute receives a fee but you give gifts to your lovers, bribing them to come to you. You talk about Israel being undesirable. Started out like an abandoned baby. Nobody loved, nobody wanted. And I said, yeah, I'll take you. And boy, he cleaned him up and just did everything for him and said, you're going to be my wife. You're going to be my, you're going to, you're going to, we're going to be together. You're my wife. And then Israel became a prostitute and such an undesirable prostitute, she had to pay her lovers. But now I call to your attention verse 60, and there are other verses in this chapter similar to this. Yet I will remember the covenant I made with you in the days of your youth, and I will establish an everlasting covenant with you. Didn't matter how sinful and wrong Israel was, God said, I'm taken by my covenant. The calling and gifts of God are irrevocable. Amen. So, the Hebrew people looked upon themselves as the church of God. There were basically two versions in the days of Christ. There was the Hebrew Bible that was the original language. And then 270 years before Christ, the Hebrew Bible was translated into Greek and that version was called the Septuagint. And 
Numbers chapter 10 said that the Lord said, I want you to make a couple of silver trumpets. And I want you to sound those trumpets. And when you sound those trumpets, all of the Israelites are to gather together in an assembly or a community. Two different Hebrew words describe that community, Edah and Kehal. They're both found in Exodus chapter 12 with reference to the Passover. The community, verse 3 was the word Edah and verse 6, the word community again is, but it's Kehal. And that word kahal, the Greek translators of the Septuagint use the word ekklesia. Uh, the word ekklesia literally means the called out ones. Ek means out of and kaleo means to call. And so they'd sound the trumpet. And boy, here they'd come to an assembly. The word ekklesia is only found three times in the four gospels and all three instances are in the gospel of Matthew so when Matthew and Peter and Andrew, James and John and so forth, Jesus says, and upon this rock I will build my ecclesia and the gates of hell shall not prevail. And well, these guys say, we know what that is. That's the kahal. That's when God sounds the trumpet, all of God's people come. That's us. That's the Hebrews. We're the ones that are God's chosen people. And even though we've been unfaithful to God, His calling and His gifts to us are irrevocable. We're home free. That's us. Now, the next text that I was assigned is in the book of Ephesians. And here you are. You're just as spiritual as I am. I don't have any right to say exactly what something means you're a child of God, and when the Father speaks, you have a right to hear his words. But it seems to me that in Ephesians, we still have a recognition of the situation where you have Jews and Gentiles. That's what the world was divided into. The Hebrew people say, yeah, we're the, we're the church of the living God. We're the church in the wilderness. That's us, the kahal. Uh, the, the trumpet sounded, and we're the ones that show up. That's us. And... For 10 years, even though Jesus had specifically commanded the apostles to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature, they didn't do it. The scriptures are explicit. In Acts chapter 11, they preached to none but Jews only. And when God wanted Peter to preach to a Gentile, he had to work a series of miracles. And it's 10 years after he had commissioned them to go into all the world and preach to everything. We're not doing that. And it is my view that probably there never were any Gentile believers in the Jerusalem church. That's why the disciples were called Christians first in Antioch. I just got to say, passing, the Bible never commands us to plant churches. It commands us to make disciples. If you plant churches, you may not have disciples. If you make disciples, you'll have a church. And uh, we've got a, you know, the word disciples found 264 times in the scriptures, Christians three times. I'm not opposing, if any, you know, <laughs> let no man suffer as a murderer, as a thief, or an evildoer, a busybody. You know, if any man suffers as a Christian, let him not be, a, you know, that's a wonderful name. And we should never be ashamed of that worthy name at all. But I just want to point out that the very essence of Christianity involves discipline and learning. So the disciples were called Christians. First, that was an integrated church where the Gentiles were welcome. Now, it's my understanding that this thing about Jews and Gentiles was very much on Paul's mind as he wrote the Ephesian letter. In fact, three years before that, he had written to the Romans and said, I want you, I think it's Romans 15, 29. So I want you to pray for me that when I go to Jerusalem with all this money for the poor saints in Judea, I want you to pray that I will be delivered from them who do not believe in Judea and that my offering for the saints will be accepted. He had gone all over the Mediterranean world collecting money to take to the poor saints in Judea. And when he got down there, he was afraid they were going to say, we ain't taking that money. You got some of this from Corinth? You expect us to take money from Corinth? You expect us to take money from Ephesus? We're not, you know. And so he had this concern. He said, you pray 
wrote to the, you pray that I will be delivered. Well, you get down there and there were thousands of Jews who believed were all zealous of the law and 40, more than 40, took a vow they wouldn't eat or drink anything till they'd killed him. So it was a very real concern that he had. You got to deliver me from them that don't believe and that the offering will, well, it was accepted. But anyhow, I think maybe the first part of chapter one is talking about Jews. It's us, 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 blessed us. He has chosen us. He has predestined us. He has given us in whom we have redemption. He has lavished us with all wisdom. He has made known to us. So it's us, 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 we. Then he talks about you. And you also were included in Christ when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. And having believed you, now I think that could very well be the Gentiles. Chapter 2, verse 1. As for you who were dead in trespasses and sins, you used to live that way. Chapter 2, verse 11. Therefore remember that formerly you who were Gentiles by birth and called the uncircumcised. Verse 17. He came and preached peace to you who were far away and peace to those who were near. For through him we both have access to the Father by one spirit. Chapter 3, verse 1. For this reason I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus for the sake of you, Gentiles. Well, at anyhow, we have this situation where there are two churches. There's one in Antioch that did allow Gentiles. There's one in Jerusalem that never did. And this is just one man's opinion. Do you remember when Philip preached to the Ethiopian eunuch Conventional wisdom says that man needs to be discipled before you turn him loose to preach. We've got to send him back to Jerusalem to at least get a BTH or something. You know, we can't just, you know, but the Bible says the Spirit of the Lord caught away Philip and the eunuch saw him no more. And I think God did that to protect the church in Ethiopia and Africa from the traditions of the Jewish church in Jerusalem. You know, Jeremiah 2.16, you know, my people have committed two sins. First, they have forsaken me, the fountain of living water, and then they've hewn out for themselves cisterns, broken cisterns, won't hold water. The Bible's like a fountain, and the Jerusalem church was like a cistern. And, I, you know, a lot of times our churches are too. That's why we ought to go right back to the Bible. We want, even if the Apostle Paul were here preaching, you would be wise and commended if you would not believe him and say, well, we want to go and check our own Bible. We want to go right back to the fountain and see if this is true or not. So now we have a Jewish church and the Jewish people say, ecclesia, we understand what that word means. That's us. They're blowing the silver trumpet and we're showing up. The Gentiles say, no, we know what the word ecclesia means because we've used it for 500 years and it refers to a political assembly. And people, instead of blowing trumpets, they're walking down the street saying, come on. They're calling out people to an assembly. That's what the ecclesia is. So the Jews, like Matthew, Mark, Luke, uh, not Luke, Luke was a Gentile. So when he used the word church, as he did in the book of Acts, had a different mindset. Now, of course, what we need to do is go back to the Bible and let Jesus tell us what the church is. Don't go to Jewish literature necessarily and don't go to Gentile literature. Just go to the fountain and find out what the nature of the church is. Now, Philippians chapter 3 and verse 14. I believe there were general calls, my, one man's opinion, and specific calls. Numbers chapter 10 says, you want everybody to come blow two trumpets. You blow one trumpet and the heads or the leaders show up and the heads of the clans show up. So God called, we're talking about the calling of God, and God called all of the Israelites, but he gave another call for the leaders and for the heads of the clans. He had one assignment for all of Israel. He had another assignment for the Levites or for the sons of Aaron or for the family of Kohath or for gifted men like Bezalel and Aholiab. 
They had a calling too. They were full of the Spirit, and they worked with their hands. You don't, the Holy Spirit sometimes empowers people to do things other than just preach. So here were these men full of the Holy Spirit. And yeah, God said, I want you guys to work on the furniture in the tabernacle. Then he called David to be a king. And he called Isaiah to be a prophet. And matter of fact, he called Isaiah from his womb, mother's womb. He called David. You know, David said, all of my days were ordained before one of them came to be. That's Psalm 139. Now God had a specific call for Isaiah and if he gave it to me I think I'd really ask for a fleece brother given <laughs> he said he was to go naked and barefoot for three years he say Lord give me a fleece you know I, I don't man or Ezekiel he was a prophet and he had a we're talking about a general call and we're talking about a specific call Ezekiel, according to Ezekiel chapter 4, he was to lay on his left side 390 days as a sign to Israel and on his right side 40 days as a sign to Judah. We're talking about you, this calling of God, and we're going to get around to you and me here in a minute, but we're seeing, first of all, there's a general call, and that was true in the church. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Well, they did, and those who came out to an assembly, that was the church. And out of the big group of disciples, Jesus prayed all night long and he chose 12 men. And the main guy that every time the gospel or the 12 apostles are mentioned, who's mentioned first? Simon Peter. And he was a man with no education. The Spanish Bible says, hombres sin letras, men without letters. I think... That, well, anyhow, when he wrote 1 Peter, he said, well, I did this with the help of Silvanus or Silas. I had to have somebody help me. And it reminds me, you know, 1 Corinthians 1, you see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called, for God shows them the foolish things of the world that confound the wise, the base things of the world that confound the things which are mighty, base things and things which are despised hath God chosen, yea, and things which are not to bring to naught things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence, but of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who has created unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification, that he that glories, glory in the Lord. That's, if, if you've got a calling from God, that's the goal. So in Philippians chapter 3, Paul was indeed uh, an Israelite. He had impeccable credentials. Yeah, he said, I'm in the tribe of Benjamin, circumcised the eighth day. He wrote to the Galatians, see, yeah, I was advanced beyond those of my own age. He had studied at the feet of Gamaliel, but he had also a specific call. There was a general call and there was a specific call, and the specific call, he was to be an apostle to the Gentiles. Acts 26, 16, For to this end have I appeared unto thee to appoint thee a minister and a witness. He said, yeah, I got this from my mother's womb. Galatians 1, 15. Acts chapter 9, Ananias said, yeah, he's a chosen vessel. He's going to witness to governors and kings. So he had the general call to be a follower of Jesus. Then he had a specific call. And I think it's significant to note that he was a witness to governors and kings. That's why they couldn't kill him in Damascus. They tried to right after his conversion. But he was let down over the wall and they tried to kill him in Jerusalem. But he got a vision saying, get out of Jerusalem. They won't accept your testimony concerning me. They tried to kill him at Lystra. In fact, they stoned him and left him for dead. They tried to kill him in Ephesus. They, all over the world. They, but... He was impervious to death until his calling was fulfilled. Now, James fulfilled his calling early, and he was beheaded, Acts chapter 12. Peter was in the same prison, and he was delivered by an angel. Was Peter more spiritual than James? I don't think so at all. They just had different callings. There's a general call for all believers. Then there's specific call. He, he appointed some to be apostles, others prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers. Romans chapter 12, 
there's seven spiritual gifts that are mentioned. 1 Corinthians chapter 12 is using the same analogy of a body. He said, we're all baptized by one spirit into one body. And God has arranged every member of the body as it pleases him. There are no vestigial organs in the body of Christ. Used to say, oh, you don't need your tonsils. Now they say, wait a minute. That they do something. After all, we didn't realize it. Or your appendix. Oh, yeah, that's important. Uh, <laughs> Kent Hovind has debated a lot of evolutionists. And they say, yeah, there's a three inches of your tailbone that is really not needed. It's a vestigial organ, something that we used to have a tail, and that's just all that's left of it. And Kent says, tell you what. I will pay to have yours removed. <laughs> if you're so cotton picking confident that you don't need that sucker, let's just cut it out. <laughs> he says, you know, there's a lot of nerve endings down there that are very, they're important to me. I want mine. <laughs> I don't want mine cut off unless it's an emergency and I have to because I'm going to be handicapped if that happens. So I really do believe in my heart of hearts that when you are added to the body that God gives you a calling, an assignment. And, it, and they're all different. There's a divergent. If, you know, if the whole body were an eye, what would you even want to hear something? Uh, you know, somebody said, what would you do without your elbow? That's kind of an interesting thought. It'd be hard to eat. You, know, you, know, you never think about an elbow being important, but it is. And God designed it that way. And you may say, well, hey, what I'm doing is not important. I was telling somebody earlier today about Sonia Carson. She, uh, just a housewife, couldn't read or write. One of 24 children. She got married at 13. And the guy she married was a liar, a bigamist, a gambler with a drinking problem. And he fathered two children by her and abandoned her. And she raised those two children in the inner city. The youngest child was the school dummy. In the fifth grade, they made fun of him. And the counselor said, why don't you put your boys in vocational school? They're just not cut out for book learning and education. She wouldn't hear to it. So she restricted their television to two hours a week. And she required them to go to the library and check out two books each week and write book reports, and she couldn't even read the book reports. They didn't know that. Her oldest son is a graduate engineer. Her youngest son is Ben Carson, the famous neurosurgeon who is internationally famous. You reckon that was a calling? Is it possible? In Philippians chapter 2, just across the page there, here's the original call, and it came to Jesus. God tapped him on the shoulder. They agreed, and he emptied himself and went down to earth with an assignment, a calling. And over and over, the Bible says his time had not yet come. Luke chapter 4, they tried to cast him headlong down a cliff, but his time had not yet come. He went down in Jerusalem and he escaped from their hand. You know, they sought the more to kill him, not only because he had profaned the Sabbath, but because he said that God was his father, making himself equal with God. And he just, oh, you know, but his time had not yet come. Then at the last Passover, he prayed and he said, Father, the time has come. Glorify thou me with thine own self with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. And when he was on the cross, he was faithful until death. And the same was true with Paul. Now he said in verse 
12, after this wonderful dissertation about Christ, his humiliation and his exaltation, therefore, my dear friend, someone said every time the word therefore is in the Bible, you need to ask why, what it is therefore. <laughs> the little cliche. Therefore, because of what Jesus, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for it's God who works in you to will and to act. To will and to do. First of all, God gives you the desire. Then he gives you the ability. When the apostles saw Jesus in a correct light, they were on a mountain. He took them to an exceeding high mountain away from all the gossip and clutter and they were just isolated up there and that's when Moses and Elijah appeared and God, you know, Peter said, well, let's build three tabernacles and God interrupted and said, Peter, this is my beloved son, hear him. I'm, I'm, please, I'm happy with him. He'll explain the law. He'll explain it. Hear him. Well, boy, that was more clear on an exceeding high mountain than it was down there in the valley where people are arguing about little petty things. I don't know whether you remember this or not, but as a pilot, I was interested in Northwest Airlines flight number 188, October the 21st, 2009. Captain Timothy Cheney and First Officer Richard Cole were at the controls of the Airbus, Airbus 320 flying from San Diego to Minneapolis, 144 passengers of five crew. And these guys got to messing around with their laptops at 37,000 feet. You remember that? And they overflew Minneapolis 150 miles at 37,000 feet, had not talked to air traffic control for over one hour, and they were getting ready to scramble jets to shoot them out of the sky because, because they didn't answer the calling they thought, man, that's a hijacked airliner and they're heading to Chicago. They're going to fly it into the Sears Tower and they're just getting ready to scramble these jets and shoot them down when a stewardess knocked on the cabin door. Somehow she got their attention and these guys turned around and were vectored 150 miles back to Minneapolis and landed without incident. They did lose their pilot's licenses. But that's a minor problem compared to you and me if we don't pay attention to the calling of God. Amen. We are to give diligence to make our calling and election sure. Amen. Venerable Bede died in 735. He had a desire. This, you know, it's God that worked in you both to will then to do it. And there were no scriptures in the English language. It was called Anglo-Saxon in those days. So Venerable Bede could read Latin and he translated it into our, the forerunner of English. And he came down to the last chapter. His feet were swelling. His breathing was labored. And he had his assistant prop him up in bed. And he completed the translation of the Gospel of John and then he died singing. He finished his course with joy. Like Jesus, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. John Relier, graduate of the Ozark Christian College, and his bride, Marcia, went to the South Pacific, worked with the Anaramu tribe. And they translated the scriptures into their language. I was talking to somebody at supper, you know, and they came... These were cannibals, converted cannibals, and they came to the story of John the Baptist and his beheading. He said, bring me the head of John the Baptist on a platter. Well, if you're translating the scriptures for cannibals, <laughs> you got to be careful how you word that. At any rate, they completed the translation of the New Testament scriptures. He was 46 years old, and he dropped dead of a heart attack. But he was happy. He had finished the course. I was listening to a radio preacher earlier this morning and he said that John Newton wrote Amazing Grace in 1793 
and nobody ever sung it to speak of until 1970, almost 200 years. And now then, it is one of the most recorded songs ever in the history of the world. I think Brother Newton was faithful unto death. I think he finished his calling. Johann Sebastian Bach wanted to glorify God with his music. He wrote, to God be the glory in the margin of song after song after song, and nobody appreciated him. They took his music and wrapped sandwiches in it. He died unnoticed, unknown, and is buried in an unmarked grave. We have no idea where Johann Sebastian Bach is buried. Eighty years after he died, a Jewish boy named Felix Mendelssohn stumbled on one of the cantatas he wrote called Matthew's Passion. He fell in love with it. And he began introducing to the world the genius of, the, of a devout follower who had been dead 80 years. He had a calling. Amy Carmichael went to India as a missionary. She was there 55 years without a furlough. C.T. Studd was born in 1860. And he went to Africa, went to Asia. He inherited a large fortune, gave that away. And as he was ready to die, he praised God that he went to China in spite of the oppositions of his family. He praised God that he had the courage to give away the money he inherited. And then he praised God that he had the courage to go to Africa in 1910 and spend the rest of his life in Africa. And as he died there, his last words were, Hallelujah! He said, forward ever, backward never, some wish to live within the sound of a church bell. I want to run a rescue shop within a yard of hell. John Mark Stallings died April, August the 2nd, 2008. He had Down syndrome, never was able to count to 10. He was baptized into Christ, though, and helped teach a class Sunday school class of four-year-olds listened to some of his accomplishments. A biography was written about him. He got an honorary high school diploma from Dallas Christian, a Change the World honor from the Abilene Christian University, an equipment room was named for him at the University of Alabama, a playground was named for him at the University of Alabama, a football field was named for him at Faulkner University, a life-size statue of him is at Faulkner University, he was named a Paul Harris Fellow at Rotary International. He was an honorary Marine. Texas A&M endowed a medical school scholarship in his honor. He represented Texas in the International Special Olympics. He was featured in the only United Way commercial ever produced by the NFL. He received the Alabama Sports Festival Medal, which was carried on the space shuttle. He kicked, the fir kicked off the first down for Down Syndrome. He was featured in People's Magazine, Reader's Diet, et cetera. Not too bad for a retarded guy that can't count to 10. But I think he had a calling, just maybe. God gave him an assignment that he didn't give to your miss like members of the body. God places members of the body in the body as it pleases him. I wrote an article probably 10 or 15 years ago and Brother Cobb has got it on a website with other material that I have written, but it surfaced just recently, and I got a, a letter in the mail from Dr. Wayne Bigelow in California thanking me for this article, and I want to conclude this message about calling with these words. Sometimes I quit but Jesus didn't. Nobody likes a quitter. And every time I quit, I like myself a little bit less. You remember Columbus, he didn't quit. You remember Edison, he didn't quit. You remember Lincoln, he didn't quit. Nobody remembers George Schwartz. <laughs> Why? 
He quit. But Jesus didn't quit. When he came down to the last few days of his life, he had a lot of opportunities to quit. He knew Judas was going to betray him, but he didn't do it. He, he let him do it anyhow. He could have tossed in the towel in Gethsemane, but he didn't do it. He could have called 12 legions of angels to his rescue, but he didn't do it. He had a calling from God, and he didn't quit. Come down from the cross was the sarcastic challenge of those who cried for his crucifixion. Jesus didn't do it. He didn't quit. With every sinew and nerve in his bleeding body crying for respite and rest, he did not quit. He was faithful until death. While the sun hid its face in amazement and the earth trembled at the awesome spectacle of Calvary, Jesus Christ was faithful and true until his last responsibility had been faithfully completed. Then and only then did he cry out with a loud voice, It is finished! And finally he released his grasp on life and yielded his spirit back to God. It was finished. He had completed the work God had given him to do. The game of life was over and Jesus had won, but he did not quit. So when I get a glimpse of the courageous Christ, I am challenged to hang in there for another day. When my eyes are blurred with sweat and tears, I am emboldened by Christ to keep on trying. I somehow won't take another step when I remember that I am following in the footprints of Jesus. When the wet blankets of discouragement and doubt threaten to overwhelm my soul, and smother out of the flame of what little faith I have, I take another look at Calvary and smile with the confidence, Jesus didn't quit, and I don't have to quit either. Amen. What a blessing it is to know in my heart of hearts that he that's within me is greater than he that's in the world. The sovereign of the universe has written me a promise that he will never leave me or forsake me. His holy word declares that I will be, never be tempted above what I'm able to bear. I am more than a conqueror through him that loved me. I don't have to quit. Every resource in heaven and earth has been marshaled by God to ensure my victory. Nothing can separate me from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus my Lord. The crown of life, as you know, is not for those who start the race. It's for those who complete it. The race of life is run before the inquiring eyes of angels and redeemed men. Through us, the principalities and powers in heavenly places observe the manifold wisdom of God. Even the angels are vitally interested in what we do. They rejoice every time a sinner repents. Jesus didn't quit. I don't have to quit. I can fight another round, play another inning, run another mile, teach another lesson, preach another sermon, pray another prayer, make another call, turn another cheek, Write another check. I don't have to quit. The Bible has good news for sinners. Jesus actually wants us to be saved. Peter denied Christ three times, got another chance. The prodigal son wasted his substance in a far country, got another chance. The woman caught in the act of adultery, got another chance. God is long-suffering towards us, not willing that any should perish, but that all come to repentance. But even God cannot save a quitter. If Judas Iscariot had only come to Christ, I am confident the Lord would have forgiven him. But he didn't. He quit like a coward. And his name will forever be associated with infamy. Don't you be like Judas. When the going gets tough, the Spirit intercedes with new power and strength. Be thou faithful unto death and you will receive the crown of life. Jesus didn't quit on you. Don't you dare quit on him. Amen. God bless you.